Hello, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here at such early hours in the deep winter and just before the end of year break. Uh, my name is Marion Janssen. I'm the chief economist of the International Trade Center, and I will be the moderator of this session titled Data and Trade, Identifying Win-Win Solutions for Future Digital Commerce. Um, at ITC, uh, we are uh, active in the area of technical assistance, trade-related technical assistance. When it comes to the dig digital world, we notably assist um, companies to uh, start working online, to uh, conduct e-commerce. We also assist governments in designing what we call e-strategies, that can be ICT strategies, VPO strategies, e-commerce strategies. Um, so we are uh, therefore not active in the area of policy design directly, uh, but many of our clients would like to understand uh, how to think about policies around um, the digital, uh, around digital trade and digital technologies. Um, so I'm uh, here to moderate and to learn from our distinguished uh, participants about this important topic. Um, I would like to learn how important this topic really is. I'm reading, and we are reading everywhere, that data is the new oil of the, of the world. Without data, nothing can happen anymore. Um, we are being told data have to f uh, f flow freely in order for this oil to be functioning. On the other hand, uh, we would like to understand, we as consumers and also as uh, also our clients, uh, many companies, what is going to happen with this data, how protected are, um, are they, and, um, and, and, and we would like to understand what are the trade-offs between um, this everything should ideally be free, uh, but on the other hand, we need to find protection. Um, Trade-offs are typically uh, often difficult to design, often difficult to define. Uh, um, in Geneva, uh, we have an organization called the World Trade Organization. I worked for that organization many years, and I uh, have been exposed to the difficulty of finding win-win answers, of finding the right uh, balance between protecting uh, only to the extent as necessary uh, to, uh, to protect, but while allowing for free flows and free trade. So I am very curious to understand um, how uh, our panelists are thinking about this topic in the context of data and trade. I will uh, just uh, uh, shortly introduce the, uh, the speakers um, in the order in which uh, we have agreed that they will intervene. Uh, we'll have on my right Adam Schlosser, project lead for digital trade and cross-border data flows at the World Economic Forum. I will ask uh, Adam later on to make the first intervention. To my left, Jovan Kurbalija, founding director of the Diplo Foundation, active here in, based here in Geneva and a key player around um, everything that is digital in, uh, in this region. Thurbon Frederiksen, uh, ICT analysis section and a key player, chief ICT analysis section at the UNCTAD and a key player in the E-Trade for All initiative. Um, at the UNCTAD. To my right, uh, Luzevis van der Laan of the Netherlands, former Dutch and European parliamentarian and a member of the board of ICANN. And uh, then further to my right, Satrio Bramono, first secretary of the permanent mission of Indonesia. Um, we are imagining a flow of the following type, where Adam and Jovan uh, start by setting a bit of general, the general stage of what are the issues, how are they being addressed at a global, at a general um, level. Uh, Thurman Fredriksen, I expect, will give um, some more insights into how the UNCTAD is approaching uh, the challenges that we have, um, have that we have raised in this introduction. And then Luzvis and Satrio, I look forward, I told Luzvis, you are the people who are supposed to then define the solutions and potentially in implement them. So I very much look forward to your uh, uh, fourth and fifth intervention. Each of you has five minutes for a first uh, statement, and then we go in rounds of questions and answers, notably potentially also with uh, an audience that is following us online. So please, Adam, uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, 
right, well, thank you so much for including me in this uh, exciting discussion. And I'm, I'm glad, looking at the title of the session, that it's deemed a win-win because good data policies will truly produce multiple winners. We could actually add more wins to that. So it's whether it's industry, government, consumers, civil society, um, there could easily be winners all around. It's not just a zero-sum or win-loss type of game. And when talking about trade and digital trade, we're thinking of it's not just going online and buying something, it's also business to business. That's one of the biggest aspects of, of digital trade as well, because now companies that are traditionally thought of as internet or data companies are, are not the only ones online. It's every single company across every single sector. All trade now has a digital component. So containers are not just things that bring your goods, it's also the vehicle by which code is transferred and shipped. So it has multiple meanings now. And last year, cross-border data flows added the equivalent of the GDP of France to the global economy. And that's not just replacing something that was previously analog, it's completely new economic generation. So it just shows, the, shows you how much value is being created from the ability to move, process, use, and store data globally. Um, so on, on, in the, uh, the, the space of trade agreements, it's important to note that while trade agreements can create and provide boundaries and guardrails for issues related to data, uh, and create collaborative norms and, and best practices, they are often not best suited as a primary means to answer concerns. Um, one, uh, they don't move quick enough. So we had a case where there was good language in the TPP and there was potentially good language in TISA, but by the time those agreements are finalized, if they ever are, and by the time you, they're implemented, and then you go through dispute resolution possibly, if there's a violation, there's gonna be a whole new type of technology out there. So in the most, the most overt cases of protectionism, they'll, they can do course correcting. For the practical sake, it's, it's not the, the best vehicle. So it's important to think of other ways to create good data policy and ensure that's in a collaborative manner between governments and between governments and civil society and industry as well. So a, a second key topic that I, I wanna bring up, and this is a bit of a, a personal crusade, uh, is that data is not the new oil. I know we like to say it and everyone mentions it, but it often leads to, to misperceptions about how to handle data, that you should hoard it behind your borders and keep it in silos like oil. So there's limitations to, to that metaphor. So, so one, data needs to be collected and maintained in a way that's usable to create new analytics and new value. And today, only 10% of all data is usable. So think about that. All this data is being collected and you can't even do anything with it. And at some point, data turns from an asset to a liability because it could be, have sensitive information there, it could be a security risk. So it's really important to know why you're collecting data. What do you want to do with it? And ensure that you're doing so in a way that protects security and privacy of that data. Otherwise, you're just racking up costs without adding to the, the benefits of it. Uh, second, data is not a finite resource. You can reuse it, you can share it, you can provide it to others, you can do dual analytics. Uh, and in fact, in the next two years, the world's gonna generate about 40 zettabytes of data. And I was trying to come up with a useful framework to explain what that means, and you can, it's so infinite. It's basically like generating four million hours of HD video, and it's, it's just really hard to grasp the amount of data that's going to be produced. So it's not a finite resource like, like oil. Um, a, a good point of reference is autonomous vehicles will be generating a lot of data uh, in the coming years. And in a scenario where, say, a, a city or a small city has a fleet of about 100,000 autonomous vehicles, which is fairly realistic. Um, San Francisco is a city now where I live, has 470,000 registered cars. So what, if one-fourth of them become autonomous in the next 15, 20 years, they'll be generating as much data as all of Twitter is this year. So you can see, imagine that scale across multiple cities and multiple regions, just the sheer amount of data that's being collected. So it's important to put the frameworks and the rules in place that allow it to be shared and used in a, a productive manner. Um, so getting to the topic of, of SMEs, how can SMEs be, be helped by data? So there's the, the obvious use cases that you could all think of, the tracking and acquiring customers, streamlining the management of logistics and production, optimizing relationships. But an underappreciated path for success and development of SMEs is the, the B2B or the business to business angle. So now the, the phrase is that the sun never sets on business. It used to be, the, I guess, the British Empire, but now it's business. It's, <laughs> it's global. There, when you're online, you can be reaching customers and conducting business all hours of the day. So that presents a really great advantage for particularly some developing economies in, in Asia and Africa um, because businesses want to have contact points and functions in every time zone. 
So those small businesses in those regions could be working on back office functions. And while it could be complex analytics, uh, financial an analysis is, is useful, but it's also a great inroads for less developed businesses uh, and less developed economies. So for example, uh, a large multinational law firm that I've, I've worked with in the past works with an SME in the Philippines to format and streamline all their PowerPoint presentations to clients. And it seems like a small function, but it's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of a contract for a simple function that without a lot of technical capability, without a lot of education, you could do that. So it really shows the opportunities that are out there by working on data, being able to transfer that data globally around the world. Um, and fitting with the title of the session, improved data protection and increased development can go hand in hand. Uh, baseline security and privacy standards are important to create a floor instead of expectations for all actors in the system. Um, but there is a great gap between no rules at all and something as complex as the EU General Data Protection Regulation. And it's important to respect the levels of development and resources availability when developing new data rules. So for example, SMEs without the ability or the sophistication to understand various rules for compliance and GDPR and other complex systems, they're facing a really uphill climb entering new markets. So perhaps an education effort is needed on how to best develop data governance strategies, as well as the importance and benefits of how using data can generate growth. And, and I'm glad I'm not the one to provide the solutions. I'll just get to give the state of play and highlight some of the issues. So I just want to throw that out there. When, when you're a large multinational company, you could easily hire 60, 100, 200 lawyers to deal with implementing GDPR. But what if you have three people? What if all of them are focused on running your business? What do you do in that scenario? So, Developed economies can work to create interoperable standards amongst them. So for example, ASEAN's working on digital integration. Uh, if they're able to create a standard that allows for data transfers to be done safely in their region, well, that, that's created a, a level playing field and potential boost for all the small businesses and all the businesses overall and consumers in that region. And then you could take that standard and bring it to APEC, you could bring it to, to other jurisdictions, and you could expand from there. So you have a baseline, you have a bunch of parties that are working to set that standard, and then you can grow as you get more sophistication and more resources available overall. Another potential way to help. Adam, yeah. please take your time. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll save my other ways to help. Oh, sorry, no, I thought you were gonna close uh, slowly. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll close out real quickly. I'll throw one other idea out there, and then I'll, I'll close quickly. So another way to, to help SMEs is to uh, incentivize publicly accessible data. So can you create tools that help the private sector actors scrub the proprietary data, and then also have special toolkits with maybe publicly accessible APIs for the SMEs to access that data and create their own analytics. That's another idea to throw out there. So uh, in closing, sound data policy is one of the best and most important ways to improve data, uh, to improve trade and development. So thank you. Thank you, um, Adam. Um, I will pass over the floor to Jovan, but maybe you want to pick up on three uh, points you um, you made. Um, you 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 complain about uh, trade agreements <laughs> being too slow. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we, indeed, we have been seeing we have been seeing some of that here in the region. Uh, trade agreements are international agreements. There are um, uh, intermediary solutions are national. It's national law um, that moves uh, typically more quickly. We see that when we compare uh, the, the evolution competition law to trade law, the competition law is still being handled nationally, and we see this being modernized at a different pace. So uh, la maybe um, later on we can come back to this issue: how um, how more dynamic can national law be, but you're also not happy with the EU, entirely happy with the EU law. So I expect I get, uh, we hear back from that about this later. I would like to say something on, on SMEs. When we work with SMEs in developing countries, there's a clear difference, a strong difference between those who are active uh, players in the digital um, uh, field or those who are uh, producers of goods or other services and who hope to sell online. Uh, SMEs that uh, are supposed to be able to take advantage of this fantastic e-commerce, SMEs we deal with often do not even know how to put a picture online. Or they start uh, making, they are, we are being told by us, please you have to establish your own website and they come up with a website that looks like the screen you see there, <laughs> um, which is something that would not attract any type of consumer. So there is, uh, we see in the field, and uh, maybe Satrio can come back to that, or, or Frederick, uh, quite a discrepancy between these potentials that SMEs in developing countries have and uh, the actual uh, capacity they seem to have 
to develop, uh, develop that. But with this, these two points I just uh, throw onto the floor. I pass over to Jovan. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Marion. Uh, well, I will start with uh, just to make a conversation flowing and using my few minutes to develop a few ideas with, uh, with uh, Adam's uh, um, uh, reflections on the question of the oil, uh, oil metaphor. And uh, yesterday over the meal uh, with some wine, uh, we discussed the oil metaphor and uh, there was one interesting question from my interlocutor. Uh, she asked me, well, Jovan, how does it happen that these companies are so rich and we don't pay for their services. Well, you're familiar how, how, it is, how it is happening, and we came to the question of, uh, of uh, uh, value of data. Obviously, there are, uh, like any metaphor and any analogy, it has commonalities, it has differences. But I think what the economists, whom, whom I still trust out of all news, newspapers, put the title a few months ago, Data as the Oil of the New Economy, they refer to the economic value that uh, data brings to those who operate those companies. Now, I would argue, if you have a time, probably it's limited, it's not the main uh, aim of the session, I would argue that the economist was right at this, uh, on this point, on the value side. Okay, it's not an uh, infinite resource uh, and there are many, many differences. But while we're still with language, I like Marion's, your, your, uh, your, uh, when you're mentioning World Trade Organization, uh, and then trade off, I said, we may coin the word World Trade Off Organization, and uh, I will keep the copyright over that, or creative commons, commons sign. Now back to the last point on the language. You are noticing the transcripts at the IGF, which is unique innovation of the Internet Governance Forum, which has a mixed, uh, uh, I would say very positive, but some people complain that, you know, in old Latin uh, scripta, uh, 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 manent volant, well, what he said is, uh, is uh, flies and what is, uh, what is written uh, is kept, uh, kept for uh, posterity. I'll have to refresh my Latin. And uh, uh, we are analyzing every day the transcripts of all sessions at the IGF. You can find them in the IGF daily. And what we noticed after the first two days is that data is the keyword, the most frequently used uh, keyword. And the second point, we notice that shift from the language of efficiency, the blue sky, uh, business opportunities, to the language of values, uh, language of trust, language of, uh, of uh, equal distribution of the dividends of digital economy, and this is the major shift comparing to the previous IGFs. We have been following the transcript for the last uh, 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 11 years. And it is the major shift from the efficiency narrative to value narrative. Now, back to the concrete question what I prepared for this, this presentation. We are living into the really decisive phase between, one can say, 10,000 feet, up, uh, between approach where data was used for data mining for the insights what the companies are doing uh, for uh, advertising and the shift for data as a basis of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is based on discovering patterns in data. And it is going to be the major, major change in the way how data, data, data is used. Therefore, this is, let's say, general framework. And then when, when we move uh, and focus in, we have GDPR. What will happen on 26th of May? Why internet companies are hiring big offices in uh, Brussels? Uh, again, yesterday during the one informal discussion, I was faced with, uh, with the argument from one computer scientist that nobody can uh, stop uh, flow of data ac across the national border and it's not possible. That, you know, the argument is that there are not borders on the internet. I'm skeptical about it because whatever is happening from my notebook to the servers to the cables is linked and anchored in geography. Therefore, it is a bit, bit argument which is also getting a bit tired. It has been for 12 years around. And whatever we can say technically, economically, on the 26th of May, whoever operates data of European citizens will have to know where those data are stored and how are they used. It is going to be a major challenge, as Adam indicated, probably bigger challenge for small companies, but I would say major challenge that may affect business model of big companies as well, and uh, we should prepare for that, uh, uh, I would say, earthquake in digital policy, 
which is much bigger than millennium bug, which, uh, which we experienced uh, in 1999 than 2000, not only because of the European Union, but countries worldwide are carefully following what is happening in Brussels. And as you can see from right to be forgotten, from anti-monopoly rules, then countries, other economies, mainly G20 economies, follow the same, same policy, like Indonesia introduced right to be forgotten, Korea introduced it, uh, and the countries worldwide then follow what's going on. Therefore, we are, ahead, uh, we are facing quite a turbulent uh, year ahead of us, mainly focused around data. On 10,000 feet, data is based on artificial intelligence or more closer to the ground, how to deal with the GDPR worldwide. Therefore, this is sort of setting from the linguistic one, from World Trade Off Organization to the, to the GDPR. Over to you. Well, I was going to rather retain the earthquake uh, terminology, and I look forward to hear uh, more on this from uh, Luz Wiss. Um, you also um, brought two uh, other aspects into the discussion, uh, the, what, the value of data, and as an economist, then we ask the question, the price of, of data. If the data are so valuable, why do we give them away for free? Um, and an important issue, one of market power. Um, the theme, SME, small players can take so much advantage of this is brought up in the discussion a lot, and I would be actually be interested to see your uh, statistics on this uh, when you analyze um, the transcripts from this event. Uh, but uh, the fact is that um, global market power in this field is, um, is amazing and maybe goes beyond what we have ever seen in terms of market power before in other markets. Uh, with this, uh, Torben, very curious to hear Torbjorn, uh, to hear your view on this. Thank you, Marion. And uh, so I'm uh, in charge of Ankle's work on uh, e-commerce, ICT, and digital economy for development. And uh, I think uh, one of the reasons is why we're seeing this uh, tremendous interest in the data flows and, and uh, cross-border data dis discussion is that I think more and more people realize that we are really on the cusp of what is going to become a very different digital economy in the, in the coming years. And we're starting to see it very much in, in developed countries now, but uh, it still has a long way to go in, uh, in the poorer economies. And it is, of course, very much uh, a result of much improved computing, storage, and transmission power uh, on the Internet. And uh, just to, to give a comparison here, in 1980, it cost about $400,000 to have a storage space for one gigabyte. Today it costs two cents. So it's really a, an em enormous change. Um, and we're seeing this rapid growth in data traffic and internet traffic. Uh, it's expected that by 2019, internet traffic would be about 66 times greater than it was in 2005. That's just 15 years difference. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we see happening here in this new digital economy is the growing role of platforms of different kinds. And these different digital platforms, they thrive on data collection. But it's not only the data collection, as was rightly pointed out. It's the analysis and, of this data and turning this data analysis into business opportunities of various kinds. And we see that uh, again, to touch upon this uh, analogy to the oil, uh, I agree also that it's not uh, a good parallel, but I agree that data is a new resource to ex extract. And perhaps one of the more important uh, uh, differences between oil and, and data is also that uh, a company that, that has a tremendous amount of oil available in the market will see the price of oil going down because there's too much supply. But if you have more data, the price, the value of that data goes up. Because the more data, the more diverse data that you have as a company, the more you can fine tune your algorithms, the more you can make use of it, and the more you can compete vis-a-vis -vis those with less access to data. And as we see this uh, being uh, taken advantage now by uh, some platforms like uh, Google and Facebook that are really collecting a lot of data and using it to sell advertising space. Uh, we have uh, other companies that are using the data to optimize the production processes, uh, production R&D sales supply chain processes, like big manufacturing firms like Rolls-Royce or Caterpillar that 
have these sensors all around their equipment and they are using this uh, real-time information to, to uh, improve their co uh, competitiveness. And then you have other players like Amazon Web Services that are leveraging the flow of data by offering cloud space, cloud uh, infrastructure, and they are basically charging by, through subscription. So there are different ways of monetizing this, this phenomenon. Uh, and and um, uh, with the increased use of cloud computing, social media, e-commerce, Internet of Things, we just see that this will grow tremendously in advance and, and also through artificial intelligence. And for the users, of course, platforms are creating tremendous value, uh, better search functions, uh, better social networking, and so on and so forth. And they are paying by giving detailed information, data, on their habits, activities, whereabouts, networks, etc., which is generating a lot of attractive intelligence, not only for businesses, but also for governments through surveillance and so on. Um, so this raises a huge range of issues related to privacy, competition policies, consumer protection, surveillance, cybercrime, fraud, etc. And from ANCTA's perspective, our prime concern is here that we have a huge gap here in the readiness of countries to engage in these discussions and also to prepare for this, uh, what's coming. We have uh, a big gaps in terms of affordable ICT and cloud infrastructure between countries. We have a lack of laws and regulations to address the potential risks involved here and to facilitate the advantages that can, uh, can be derived. And we have a lack of skills so it's not only a question of collecting data, you need the skills also to make use of those data. And here there is a tremendous lack of data scientists and this gap is particularly uh, uh, apparent in developing countries. And that makes, bas basically puts the developing countries at a disadvantage in this uh, area. So f a few words just on what we can do in that uh, context to try to support developing countries in, in preparing. We can do research and uh, analyze what's happening, what we do in the Information Economy Report. We try to become better at providing capacity building in key areas, uh, not least through our partnership with all the other uh, players like uh, Diplo, ITC, and, and uh, 25 other international organizations under E-Trade for All. Uh, and also to provide uh, meeting venues, uh, forums for countries to come together and discuss these issues, ideally in a multi-stakeholder setting, and also where uh, all the countries of the world are present. And uh, two uh, specific uh, activities here are, would be the e-commerce week that is happening in April, and also the ANCTA intergovernmental group of experts on e-commerce and the digital economy. So thanks again. Thank you, Torbjorn. And I already noticed one disadvantage of these transcripts. I have to make sure I pronounce your name correctly in order for it to be spelled correctly when it appears here. Uh, thank you for your points, Torbjorn. I thank you uh, for making reference to the um, infrastructure uh, challenge, notably in developing countries, the legal challenges we have already mentioned, but also for mentioning the skills uh, dimension. Um, I, uh, um, to, by talking to my, my adolescent daughters, realized that even though they are uh, very active users of these new technologies, uh, contrary to myself, who learned how to program and how to write algorithms, because I was exposed to the very old-fashioned type of computers, um, they only know how to use these tools. They do not, have not learned how these, uh, how these tools are programmed and how to be active and uh, creative users um, of uh, these tools. So skills development, definitely an important aspect. Louis, European policy has been mentioned a lot. Um, I look forward to your uh, points. I would like to say in this context, though, that um, when, when I look at the legal texts and discussion coming out of Brussels, notably, I see a lot of WTO terminology. I see terms like mode one coming up, like necessity types of uh, tests. So um, there is definitely uh, also in this area some value for the kind of legal language that has come and is coming out of the World Trade Organization, but please uh, let us know more about this earthquake uh, that is coming. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you very much. We'll have to see if it's an earthquake or you know just a very slow, slow development. But uh, 
uh, GDPR is going to have a big impact. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my perspective as a former legislator, but also I think the perspective of the consumers when, when you come to this. And um, my political background is as a social liberal. Now, in the European context, that means something completely different than uh, I think in an American or another kind of context. But basically, we're very much in, in favor of free trade and open markets, um, but at the same time, very strong on human rights, on, on data protection. And I think the two go hand in hand. And that would be, uh, I think, is one of the key things that in any win-win solution uh, would have to be uh, be a part of this. this. These two are not in some way contradictory or mutually exclusive. I think on the contrary, I think you can have incredibly strong economies uh, and uh, large global wealth only if you put consumer protection and protection of human rights at, uh, at the forefront. And if you look at uh, strong economies around the world, I think there's a lot of evidence uh, for that. So I think any win-win solution, I would love to have, you know, be able to tick that, tick that box. Now, as you can probably hear by my accent, um, I grew up in the US, uh, but I'm Dutch. And so what I find very interesting in this whole discussion about data protection is that the Americans and the Europeans have a very different perspective on this. And if I'm, I'm just going to dramatize it a bit to make the point, um, but basically, Americans don't really care what happens to their data. They know it's being mined, it's being sold, uh, someone's cashing in on it, um, they don't care. Uh, whereas Europeans are exactly the opposite. Um, they're like, wait, we have a different kind of history. Who has our data? What are they doing with it? Wait, governments can get their hand on, hands on it? In my country, the Netherlands, we have um, uh, a new law on uh, health data, which keeps on being blocked because we want to know who would be able to access the health data. We all know that if you have a general database, it's a small country, 17 million people, you know, I think smaller than major Chinese towns these days, um, that you put all that data together and it's useful. You go to your doctor, uh, he's, he has the same access uh, to the data as the hospital has. You're not going to get wrong medication. You're not, you know, it can save lives. But the idea that someone in a hospital can simply access my data uh, and I won't know who that person is, why they're accessing it, uh, what the effect is, that, that is not going to fly with most Dutch people and actually with most Europeans. What I would like to have is I would like to have a system whereby the second anyone access my medical data, I want an alert on my phone. So if I'm sitting with my gyne gynecologist and uh, and he, you know, and it pops up and goes, oh yeah, no, it's good, that's fine. We're having, to, if it happens in the middle of the night and I haven't been to any medical situation, you know, then I really want to know who's doing it and why, uh, et cetera, and I will be able to trace that to the exact person who did it. So that I think is one of the other solutions, that if people are reassured that whoever is accessing their data is doing it for a valid reason and that I'm informed when that happens, then, then that, it maybe, maybe sounds co sound complicated, but that way people will be much more relaxed about doing it. Um, now, when you come to the, to the, the new uh, general data protection regulation that is going to be, it's already in force, but it's going to be um, applied from May and there will be major fines. I know there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's causing a lot of waves uh, around the world. It was set up to solve an internal European problem. Um, the 28 member states had different data protection regimes and that was complicated for our businesses. And so um, we thought, well, let's see if that can be solved in some way by having some harmony there. And then, of course, the discussion went to, well, what about if the data is owned outside of the EU? And that's why we now have a system where basically the law will have extraterritorial effect. Because if you have data on any European data subject, you have to comply with this law. And it doesn't matter if you're running an e-commerce shop in China, it doesn't matter if you put your offices in the US, but it, it works that way. So I think this is going to be fascinating to see what kind of effect this has, because the data protection standards are very high, even for European standards, they're very high, and everyone will have to comply with it, or they could be fined. Uh, and I totally understand your point, Adam, that it's complex, um, Everyone in Europe is still figuring out what, uh, how it works. So I can just imagine if you're, you know, a three-man company sitting somewhere in Idaho, you know, how are you going to figure that? Yes, that will be very complicated, uh, and we will figure it out along the way. But I'm, I have a pretty good idea the European Commission is not going to go for the three guys in Idaho. Um, when, they, when they start finding, I think they're going to grab, you know, one of the big ones with a huge turnover because, you know, that that has has benefits all around. Um, but I think the um, 
the, the, the consumer aspect has to be taken into account here, and I want to use my last minutes for that. As a consumer, I find um, everything that's happening with data both terrifying and thrilling at the same time. The terrifying aspect is that um, if I want to do anything, I have to click accept. I don't know what I'm agreeing to. Um, nobody reads those things, and people that do, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. I want to use all those products. I want to work with these companies. I love the innovation. I love the disruption. I cannot live without my TripAdvisor, my booking, my Uber, and all these kind of things. <coughs> so, so I want that to keep going. That, that is one thing I think consumers want and adore, and that's why they constantly click on accept and, and you know, agree to all kinds of things. What is terrifying about it is that you don't know what happens with it. So, now, the way that we can keep on having all these benefits, and I, and I think that the new challenges will be even more exciting because, you know, with artificial intelligence coming up, we're going to have better medical help. We're going to have, be able to take care of the elderly. We're going to make sure that certain jobs are going to be done in a way that it opens up more free time and more wealth uh, for all of us. Um, if we want to keep harnessing this, I think what needs to happen is that we have to make sure it's not some kind of wild west in which people feel scared because that's when the politicians wake up. Politicians don't go out making laws to make people's lives complicated. They hear a cry from society. They hear that people are worried, that there are concerns, they see that there is abuse, that there are problems, and then they feel they have to come in. And, and what's happening now, I feel, is a reaction to the f initial Wild West uh, that there was, and then, you know, somebody feels like the sheriff has to come in and set things in order. Maybe an overreaction, maybe not, but that's what you get. So my advice, especially to the, the private sector representatives here, is rather than enjoying the Wild West and, you know, profiting from that to a maximum, why don't you already start thinking about what the backlash will be? Think about what the consumers need. Think about the other aspects, because if you don't self-regulate, you are just inviting governments to come in and do it for you. And my, in my experience, and this is where I'm, I'm more of a liberal, uh, I would rather have good, effective self-regulation and, and addressing consumers' needs rather than having governments come in either heavy-handedly doing something or in the ca this case, having one region come in and doing one thing, having other regions come in and doing another thing, and who knows when the world is going to get together and actually set some kind of global standard, which would be ideal for businesses, but it may not happen, so you're going to be dealing with, on a global level, what we were dealing with in the EU for a long time, 28 different regimes. If you're a global business, you're dealing with, what, 180 different regimes? So, so there's, this is re would really be my plea. There is no contradiction between effective open markets uh, that cause, have prosperity for all of us and strong consumer protection and data protection and human rights. Uh, but make sure that you take them into account as you develop your products, uh, your economies, because otherwise you're just inviting regulation in, and that is not, I think, what most people want. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Louis. Very, thank you very much for, for putting the emphasis on, con on consumers. Uh, to come back to the WTO narrative, I, when I joined WTO in 1999, uh, I did a search for the word consumer in existing uh, uh, agreements, in the existing legal text, and that word didn't appear. So if uh, there has been one innovation of uh, e-commerce and digital discussion in the trade context is that in the e-commerce chapters uh, in trade agreements, we now see the term consumer protection appearing. Personally, I definitely think this is uh, a progress. Thank you for emphasizing uh, the uh, importance of uh, consumer protection or consumer concerns to be uh, part of the win-win solution um, in the good old economics that Jovan still, thank you, believes in. Um, uh, we learned, I remember to have learned uh, where information asymmetries exist and they are all over the place in this field. Uh, markets can disappear if uh, consumers lose trust, they stop using. Uh, the, um, the technology, uh, so definitely helping uh, consumers to feel safe, to trust the technologies uh, uh, should maybe be part of the win-win solution. And uh, last but not least, I think a great plea uh, to say, please use this technology that uh, apparently can do everything to send me the information I want to have to my phone, uh, for instance, on who accesses uh, the data. If everything else is not complicated and can be done uh, in this fantastic field of free data flow, then uh, maybe let's also develop the technologies consumers are asking for. Satrio. 
Last intervention, uh, you have the possibility to react to everything you he he heard, but also, please, a point of view from your country. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, and uh, thank you for putting me on the spot regarding the views of developing countries. But uh, basically, if I could just begin by giving a small profile of uh, what in, how Indonesia is in the digital economy. Indonesia has, is a big developing country. Uh, it's 260 million population. Out of that 260 million, 93.4 million are internet users, mostly from smartphones. The internet penetration has reached 52%, um, and online shoppers have reached 8.7 million with e-commerce transaction value at $4.8 million. There's been a lot of hype about the Indonesian digital uh, economy or e-commerce. Uh, we are seen as in the beginning of a boom. Uh, in 2017 alone, three billion U.S. dollars has uh, of in foreign investment has uh, gone to our startups. So the the potential is big. However, as a developing country, uh, I want to uh, give you the sobering reality. Uh, we've talked. I think I've heard a lot about data. Uh, how data should be managed, the policies regarding data protection. But in developing countries, there's simply no data. Uh, I can tell you that in Indonesia, one of the main problems of the digital economy is that 30, only 36% of the population are banked. Only 36% of the population have accounts in formal banking institutions or financial institutions. Only 23% have made or received digital payments. Uh, if when you talk about SMEs, 59% of MSMEs have an account at a formal financial institutions. And if you're talking about online presence, only 9% of MS SMEs have uh, an online presence. So when we talk about digital economy, when we talk about data policy, what's important also is the issue of financial inclusion, particularly for developing countries. Because 36% of the population having something as simple as a bank account uh, is, is, is a major reality check if we talk about data protection because for developing countries, we're not talking about protecting data. I mean, th yes, th that, th that much is, is very important, but more importantly is how to create data because simply <laughs> in, the, uh, in the digital data flows in this world, uh, most of the open country citizens are simply invisible. Um, they don't exist. Um, in Indonesia, a lot of uh, private actor uh, and businesses in the private market have tried to um, try to have innovations regarding this issue. For instance, if you if you don't have a bank account but you want to buy something online, you can go to the local uh, convenience store, which has a big wide uh, distribution around the country. Um, so you order it online, and the way you pay is to go to a cashier at this convenience store and pay in cash, and that store, or that franchise store, will pay your good for you, and then the good gets sent to your home. So basically, um, um, I would also like to stress that if you talk about data policy or, um, and digital economy, financial inclusion and digital literacy policies go hand in hand but they're mutually reinforcing uh, because, uh, at least in Indonesia's experience, uh, digital economy is seen as a uh, opportunity, a transformative opportunity for our development um, because they're mutually reinforcing. If the economy is getting more digitalized or becoming more online, uh, obviously market forces will compel more citizens to feel the need to create, to make bank accounts, for instance or to have access to uh, uh, um, financial instruments that can be used online. Uh, secondly, um, the, uh, the uh, rise of the uh, digital economy in developing countries presents opportunities for companies to have to create um, very innovative uh, banking methods. Uh, for instance, in Indonesia, the, a lot of banks are going uh, with the idea of branchless banking through smartphones. So big banks are um, uh, hiring agents in rural areas and areas where there are no branches to provide services through smartphones to uh, just normal consumers. 
So the other, so despite the stark reality that, uh, at least in Indonesia, most people don't even a have access to financial um, services, actually the rise of ICT, uh, of ICT and digital economy provides an opportunity for, um, for innovations that will bring those citizens uh, to be included in the financial system and the formal sector. I think those are just some of my views. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks also for bringing this, uh, this um, topic of uh, financial inclusion uh, up. Indeed, in our uh, own survey work, we do find that uh, e uh, as possibility to conduct e-payments, in particular across borders, is a major bottleneck for, um, for SMEs, and that also in regions uh, like Africa, where mobile payments, we hear a lot about mobile payments, but the, the, um, most of the payments also for e-commerce are still conducted on a cash basis, so um, as you uh, also mentioned. Um, we only have around 13 minutes left for the Q&A uh, part of this, so I would like to propose to collect a few questions from the floor and also from online participants if there are questions, and then uh, give uh, the floor for a last one minute statement to each of the participants. So please, audience in the room, the floor is yours for questions. First questions from the WTO. Hi, well, I, I'm, I'm not speaking for WTO. Um, I think there's a lot of attempt to look uh, and find um, best practice that people can draw upon. And when I think about the, the EU's uh, new data proposal, I think the thing I think about is the more complex it is and, and the more costly it is to implement, the more it may co uh, SMEs may not find it works for them. and. Um, the more the implementation costs are for the government and the complexity. You have governments with less capacity and less humans even uh, to do this. Uh, what Do you think that there's ways that what the EU is going down could be adopted in other countries? Uh, or is there something else we need to come up with that might be easier to adapt in developing countries? Thank you. Any further questions? online participant. Thank you, and give me the, this gives me the opportunity to introduce Roxanne from the Diplo Foundation. Thank you very much. So on behalf of our online participants, we have two questions. First one of them, how do you think the U.S. Federal Communications Commission decision to end net neutrality will affect e-commerce data flows and trade? And the second one of them refers to uh, the WTO rulings. To limit protectionism in other areas, the WTO relies on the work of standard-setting bodies such as Codex Alimentarius for food safety and ISO for technical barriers. Do you see an equivalent uh, standard setter for the digital world? Thank you very much. No, I thank those online participants for those questions. Indeed, uh, the, the neutrality, net neutrality theme hadn't come up yet. Uh, good to pick this up now in the, towards the end of the session. Any more questions? From the Hi, my name is Faye and I'm an intern at the Dutch Mission. Uh, I am a student, uh, I studied GDPR, which was re really relevant. Um, but I have a, I have a reaction on uh, Lucewees because um, what we saw about pr privacy and the European spir spirit for more privacy, uh, that is because of our um, history because we, uh, as Europeans, during the war, uh, for example, Germany, we didn't trust uh, our governments anymore. So how do you think that we can create more awareness for people around the world about privacy? One last question. If not, I think we have a lot on our plate already with these uh, the ones we got. So um, the question on uh, is, uh, what's the best trade-off between complexity, possible costs of regulation, um, and potential effectiveness um, in order to create this win-win? This win -win. Uh, what's the, uh, what will be the effect of uh, the new decisions from the U.S. regarding net uh, neutrality? Uh, again, as part of this, uh, what, what is the optimal policy setting, freedom? Neon neutrality, market power, protection, where are we uh, positioned? Where do we have to, where do we, in what kind of balance do we end up? No, I'm very interested how that's written down, all this hesitation. 
When what? Your accent and my accent. Oh, okay. Um, standard setting bodies. You mentioned the term standardization. We heard standards before by several speakers. So what's the role of standards in order to talk to each other technically or in regulations? And then the role of history in different attitudes. Uh, to, uh, to privacy uh, protection. I think I give the floor back in the original order of speakers. Eight minutes, that gives you I some, something like 1.4 minutes <laughs> per speaker. Please, uh, please uh, stick to the time. I think we have to leave the room really at 10 a.m. Thanks, Adam. All right, well, I, I will do lightning round very, very quickly. Uh, responding to some of the comments earlier, I think the financial inclusion point is excellent and that brings up the fact that not all data is social media search engine data. Um, providing data that shows that you paid your bills on time can help build credit reporting. That's not always included. So the positive financial data is very important. Uh, on GDPR, it is, I, I didn't say it was, it was bad. It's polarizing, I guess, would be the way to describe it. Uh, and one thing that could be done is maybe like a starter pack. So for developing economies, they could have some aspects to implement because not only do the company needs to be trained, but the regulators do too. And they need to, they don't, they can't just jump into the, the literally the deepest end possible. So that there's both uh, education and capacity building for all pieces. And then I'm talking a little bit fast. On the standards point, um, they already do exist in the, the digital sector. So ISOS standards on cybersecurity that are, are used around the world. Uh, there's also some standards being developed around anonymization and encryption techniques that will be very useful. So those are some processes that are already underway and could pos possibly be scaled. How'd I do? Great. Okay, I was trying to see how, how the program deals with speed and talking. I haven't <laughs> figured that out yet. Jovan, floor is yours. In addition to my accent, I will try to speak very fast. Uh, net neutrality. Uh, uh, one point which is very important. I uh, benefited a lot from the internet and I'm big fan and big uh, uh, pioneer, uh, well, pioneer in online education. When I'm bringing critical points, I'm concerned that uh, our uh, naivety and our uh, sort of not tackling the issues can endanger this big innovation. That's, let me put this in the, into, the, into, the, into a clear context. They were putting the things under the carpet, uh, thinking that nobody, nothing is happening is very dangerous for the internet. Now, on the first point, brings me to the point on net neutrality. Net neutrality, obviously, I'm for net neutrality by all means, because it is enabling, it uh, provides the traffic. But there is one problem in net neutrality, which is economic, which is not a, a transparency in sharing the values. And telecom companies all over the world are coming and pushing and trying to get a bigger slice from the digital income pie. Let, 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 let us be clear on that. This is behind their move on the net neutrality. Therefore, if we have more transparency in the, in the economy, digital economy, and how uh, the data is the oil of new economy, I would say that we wouldn't come to the, this radical situation where the core infrastructure of the internet could be endangered with the risk of, uh, of uh, dismantling net neutrality. This is the first point. Second point on privacy. Privacy exists all over the world in different contexts. African Union, introduced conf uh, convention which has a very interesting title and I advise you all of you to consult it. It is uh, African Convention on Cybersecurity, Data Protection and Economic Transactions. In the countries on the conflict zones in Africa, the question of privacy and data protection is the question of life and death. And therefore, we have a different context in which privacy is considered. European context is specific, it's historically determined, but there are different contexts in which privacy is locally, locally considered. Well, two minutes? Yeah, I think okay. Uh, well, that was 1.6 <laughs> minutes, thank you. Transparency, important point you brought, uh, brought up, life and death, earthquakes. Uh, oh, and, but the point also, Luz, we said before, we maybe need uh, to think about these things uh, deeply in order to keep the tools alive. Mm -hmm. are very often modest. Just one thing, uh, we should share more Indonesian great success. Indonesia is the country uh, with most trusted governments online in all analysis, WEF analysis, Ipsos analysis, and uh, I'm very proud that I'm today on the panel with our Indonesian colleagues. Satri, we'll come back to that, but first, uh, gosh. You can practice until uh, the next. Yeah, so, okay. uh, thank you. Uh, no, there are a lot of things that, that need to be said and there's no time. Uh, I think uh, moving forward in this area, we, we, there's no doubt that data will not, gr that 
data will grow in importance, so there will be a growing need to come into some kind of common approach uh, in the world because uh, much of the data is flowing across borders. Uh, and we know that there, there is not a common approach right now, not even among developed countries uh, like between the US and, and, and Europe. And I think one needs to look carefully at the different concerns of the different stakeholders, from business, from governments, from national security issues, from consumers, from others, and try to see what are the best ways of addressing these concerns without distorting trade unnecessarily. I think an issue that maybe I can throw also into the question to, to my Dutch colleague here, uh, is uh, if you have looked uh, at the European level at the possible implications of the new GDPR for the ability of developing countries to export back, like outsourcing services to these countries, and does the EU have any plans for helping uh, other countries to cope with the new rules in uh, the European Union uh, so that it doesn't have a negative impact on the ability of uh, developing countries to export to the European market. Thank you. That was a direct question to Luis, and uh, other questions were directed to you. Yeah. Um, the answer is I don't know, because I don't work for the European Commission, uh, but I, there's a lot of them here, so I, I'm sure we can find it, and I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it, and I'm sure that somebody will come, come up. Uh, with an answer. Uh, from a historical point of view, uh, Europeans, even though they talk a lot about wanting to help developing countries, we'd rather close off the borders, be protectionist, uh, you know, not share in the wealth and everything, and then are surprised when many migrants want to come and share in that wealth, you know, and I, I've always made the point of either we open up the markets or we open up the borders, but you can't, you know, can't have it both ways. So I think Europe has a long way to go to go in that. But that's my, my personal political opinion. So um, I think the um, uh, what's interesting about some of the SMEs in the European Union dealing with GDPR is that it's going to be quite easy for them because GDPR just uh, basically it's all European laws. So many Dutch companies, because they comply with comply with Dutch data protection standards, for them GDPR is a a piece of cake because they've already been complying with it for for decades, so that's that's very relaxed. It's much more difficult if you come from a completely different um, uh, jurisdiction. Um, and, and I like your idea, Adam, about saying let's see if there's a, like a starter pack or something. I I, I I really like that idea. What I find interesting about the notion of you know that that Europeans look at things very differently. You know, as you were pointing out historically, also the way we relate to governments. You know, Americans trust our government even less than Europeans do. I find that very interesting. But they, that has different, you know, they don't like paying taxes. There's a lot, strong libertarian streak. They don't come out to vote, et cetera. But it, on this, it's almost like because the data is with companies and Americans do trust companies, that that's why the divergence uh, has come. And I think we have a difference there, you know. Uh, there, and that, that cultural difference is very interesting. So one of my recommendations, actually, is let's keep talking. Let's keep talking about how these things affect different parts of the world, how they affect your part of the world, how they, the differences between the US and Europe. And let's come up with the best standards that actually work in practice. And just to go back to my, uh, th the way I tried to do this in my, in my private life in Holland, um, besides being on the ICANN board, I have two activities I engage in. One is I'm the board of something called Alert Online. We try to make people aware of what they do online. And the generation, I think your kids are about the same age as my kids, they are very cyber savvy, but they're totally sloppy when it comes to their data. They go on, on unprotected Wi-Fi, they share their password. <laughs> they, you know, so they have no idea what's happening with that. But to raise awareness, and we do that on, at a national level, we do that with different generations, we do that in organizations, that is going to be one of the key things to keep people aware of what happens to your data and how you operate online. The other part of what I do is that I'm, I'm part of a, a bunch of uh, guys who are supporting startups. So when small companies say, hey, I have a great idea, and most of them, of course, are working with data in one way or another, we try to find venture capital, we try to find investments to do that. So I think, you know, on the one hand, making people aware of the risks at the same time, enabling the opportunities, that is the way. And that's we're going to be doing that at local and at national level, and then hopefully Let's take those best practices, exchange them. I love your idea about that. Let's keep on exchanging them so that whatever can be leveraged either to a higher level or can just be copied in other parts of the world, let's benefit from that knowledge. Thank you. And Satrio, best practice, apparently best practice of trusted governments that lies with you. Again, you're put on the spot. Uh, your closing words. 
Thank you. Uh, just to respond to the uh, is issue of standards, um, this is where Geneva plays such a big role for us in Indonesia. Um, we will submit a uh, draft bill of national privacy laws to the parliament next year. But a lot of our uh, internet regulation actually was born in Geneva. Diplo Foundation provided a lot of reference for our uh, internet governance um, uh, standards. Uh, UNCTAD does a lot of work and provides us a lot with um, legal framework and regulatory um, um, inputs. So I just want to emphasize here that the role of, uh, international, uh, of our international friends, of international organizations is very important, uh, at least for Indonesia. Most trusted government, yes, um, thank you. Uh, but I, and I, I, in my past life, I did work on the open government uh, initiative. I'm, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of this, but basically, it's it, it's a, it's a, a, a basically a, a network of governments who try to um, emphasize the importance of the internet in in in, uh, in terms of providing public services and accountability. Uh, just. Uh, Please don't mention this to my ambassador, but uh, in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I would just share to you the effect of uh, being so-called trusted government is that, for instance, um, there's an app called Lapor uh, in Indonesia, available to all Indonesian citizens. Basically, uh, if an Indonesian citizen goes to my office and um, is treated badly or gets bad uh, services, he can report directly to the president's office through this app. And by law, when the president's office uh, trans, uh, um, forwards that complaint to my office, I, by law, I ha well, our office has to respond. So that's just uh, a little <laughs> example of uh, the, the work that it takes to become a most trusted government online. Thank you of the disadvantages of all these technologies. So, uh, thanks to technology, it will now be also known to the world that, world that I have problems to pronounce Torbjorn's name. Um, I thank the panel for this very interesting uh, discussion. I look forward to staying in touch. Uh, those of you who are based in Geneva and who want to learn more about this and related topics, consider enrolling for the just-in-time course on digital commerce uh, that some of us here uh, will be organizing starting on January. January 29th, so it's organized by the Geneva Internet Platform, COTS, ITC, Diplo Foundation, and UNCTAD. So maybe I can see some of you uh, there in the near future. But before you enroll and before you leave the room, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists uh, for this interesting discussion. Yeah,